screams of destruction on every hand. Black water, black water runs down through my land. I'd like to say uh, I'm from southern West Virginia, your energy sacrifice zone for coal mining. <laughs> and, uh, and if you're from a holler in West Virginia or eastern Kentucky, you pronounce it like, I'm going to throw an apple at you. <laughs> and that's how it's pronounced. That's how we pronounce it if you're from a holler. <laughs> and I uh, uh, would like to tell you that, indeed, southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky is a third world country within a very rich nation. And we do live in a third world country. And you just need to come and visit to understand that. And uh, I'd like to say that I lived in a holler. We call a holler as a very narrow place between two mountain peaks, and very narrow. I became an activist in that holler, in that same holler where I was born, where my mother and father and my grandparents were born. I'm eighth generation living in the same valley. And I became an activist during the summer of 96 and 97, during that summer. And my grandfather and father were all, both coal miners, and so I was used to coal mining, but this company came into my hauler, and he started, they started to destroy and mine coal in a very different, irresponsible way than I was used to. And what I watched was, was black water rolled down by the Little Marsh Fork, the stream where six generations of my family had recreated in, had fished in, had fed and bathed, many of my ancestors, including myself. And then I realized, oh my God, they're poisoning the whole town of Whitesville and Sylvester below me. They're poisoning the whole town of everybody I love and have known all of my life. And then a few weeks later, I discovered my grandson standing in a stream full of dead fish, and he was six years old, and dead fish floating around him, his little chubby hands full of fish, and he said, hey mama, what's wrong with these fish? And then I screamed, get out of the stream, get out of the river, get out of the creek. And so I started to investigate a little bit more and I noticed my neighbors above me moving out. And I realized somebody had to do something. About six months later, I realized that somebody was me. It was me. It had to be me, it has to be somebody. And as the an old Navajo saying goes, you are the one that you've been waiting for. Don't wait for anyone else. You are the one. So during the next couple of months, I, I, I called a couple of lawyers, you know, and um, basically I told this lawyer, local lawyer, about my problem. There was coal dust everywhere, all over everything in my house and outside my house. My grandson was developing asthma. There was black water spills. They're blasting and shaking my house, and, and I'm having a lot of problems. And he said, well, Miss Bonds, what do you want me to do? You know, this is cold country you're living in. You gotta go along, get along. I said, well, you know what? I ain't to go along, get along type. And I don't reckon you're the right lawyer for me, you're a pussy. And I hung up the phone, <laughs> and then I saw some posters up, and it was for a new group that had started in the valley called Coal River Mountain Watch. It just had started two months before that. And what I did was I came to that meeting and found out there were a few other people that was having coal problems too. And so we connected. And so, we so what we're looking at now is a, is a new environmental movement, so to speak. It it's, it's, comes from environmental justice activists. And, uh, and not to say that the first environmental movement was, was bad and that those that tried to, to you know, have parks and nat national recreation areas was bad. You know, but the problem is they got labeled as white, rich, elitist. We are people that's being poisoned. Our loved ones are being poisoned. We are people that's worried about the human species as a whole. We're worried about where we live at and who's going to live there after us. So we are environmental activists because we have to be environmental activists. And I remember my very first action in Washington, D.C., and um, we closed down a Bank of America that day and did a die-in. And we took lumps of coal where we died in and we outlined where we died at. And um, 
so a conservative radio talk show host wanted to talk to one of us. So one of the um, organizers of the action handed the phone to me, and he says, so Ms. Bonds, isn't this just a bunch of rich white elitists? And I said, excuse me, sir, but I'm a coal miner's daughter. Do I sound like a white elite, rich white elitist to you? I'm from southern West Virginia. Never heard that phrase again from him. He was very cordial to me. He let me, you know, get out the points that I wanted to make. And, and so right from the beginning, you know, I made him step back. I put him on the defense. And, and that's what you've got to do. You've got to do that from the very beginning. You've got to not go on, de not go on the defense of yourself. You've got to put them on the defense. That America relates to what they can touch, feel, and see. So it's a visual world out there. And you got to have a buzzword, and you got to know how to package life. Because is, indeed, isn't that what we're selling? Isn't that what we're trying to show America? That life is in clean air and clean water, and not chemicals, and, and not, not processed food, you know, homegrown food. So what we're trying to sell is a very good product. It's just we have to learn how to relate that to America. We have to learn how to package this product. And we have to learn how to sell this product. Because when I first started out, I thought, all I have to do is tell the truth, and they'll see the truth. Well, they did. But it didn't resonate within them until I took films around America and showed them the boom, that blast of blowing up mountains, until I showed them black water. When I say we live in a third world country, I'm telling you the truth. The coal industry owns 95% of the politicians, 95% of the media, and all the way from the governor to the dog catcher. And, and that's what happens when an industry comes in for 140 years has oppressed my people. And, and I want you all to know all these corporations that you're fighting is operating out of the same handbook that they've been using for over 140 years. Well, not in the last 10 to 15 years because, you know, about 20 years, because people that are tired of being blasted and tired of being poisoned are rising up, and a lot of them are in this room today. Because using three and a half million pounds of explosives a day in Appalachia equals one Hiroshima-type bomb a week. You know, it's stop bombing Appalachia. And that man stands and talks with his hat in his head. down.